So I was watching some videos on YouTube on the topic of planes and why planes fly. And what I saw was so discouraging and disheartening and, and abysmal um, that I really felt the need to make this video out of frustration. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Elal Karguli. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And even though my PhD is in electrical engineering with a focus on systems, I work with spacecraft. Um, so I'm someone who's very familiar with flight dynamics and mechanics. Um, and I felt the need to make this video because um, a lot of the videos on YouTube that explain planes either reference some type of equation and tell you like what's going on in the equation um, or like they, they cite Bernoulli and Newton and they say oh there's a debate between them and like which one is the right one or maybe both are right or maybe one is misleading what's one's not the other and w some of them are well-meaning some of them are pretty good I mean to make this video as a very intuitive understanding of the physics of why an airplane flies not just like throwing equations at you and saying oh look at this variable because of this variable we're gonna we're gonna explain the equations and what they do most importantly I want you to actually grasp an intuitive feel like actually feel the forces and and the physics behind what makes a plane fly now real quick if you ask someone how anything works especially in the realm of physics and the first thing they do is they go and they, uh, they they draw an equation you should run as fast as you can because that's a sign that this person does not actually understand the physics of what's going on someone who's very well versed in physics will try to give you like a visual an analogy will explain it to you in a way that's like makes sense to your brain then they'll draw out an equation and actually point you to what each of the variables are saying that's a really good physics teacher. Uh, someone who does not fully understand physics, maybe only understanding the math behind the physics, is going to point to the equation immediately. And that's one thing I want to talk about first before I dive into this explanation is um, math is kind of, think of math as like a transfer function between like physics and your brain. So like your brain, in order to understand physics, very often we come up with equations, formulations that describe what the physics is doing and that gives us a framework and, and something to understand as humans. But those who truly understand physics can bypass that and can just immediately go from like perception to like physics, like actually observe the reality of the situation in, in a way that we're gonna explain over here. So what I have over here is the plane. I have this Bernoulli equation, I have this Newton equation. We're gonna erase both of these. We're gonna get, get back to those in a little bit, but that's not really what I'm interested in right now, right? Uh, there's this arrow that's saying how, this is a force, basically the force of lift. How's the plane going up? And before I go ahead and I explain the forces that cause the airplane to go up, surprise surprise is going to have to do with the wings and it's going to have to do with the air molecules i don't want to talk about planes we're going to talk about planes in a little bit i want to start with something much simpler i'm going to start with a fish there's a fish swimming in the water and then i want to talk about some dude who is about to jump so like let's say he's like on a bridge and there's like water here and this person's about to jump and he's about to go into the water and let's say this is like a distance of one kilometer okay now this is gonna be a very important analogy to explain the concept of what's happening during lift. This is gonna be a very important analogy to explain why control elements on an airplane work. And we're gonna explain that in a second. But basically, if this person were to go ahead and jump into the water, and let's say the distance is one kilometer, like that's, that's a very far distance, um, what's gonna happen? Is, is he just gonna like submerge easily or is it gonna hurt? Is it gonna almost feel solid? Maybe he'll even break something. It's, the water is probably gonna feel like you've probably seen that before where like someone falls from a distance They break something and die or even if you've seen, seen a plane crash into the ocean It doesn't just submerge into water it usually crashes and shatters into like a lot a lot of pieces We're gonna explain why that is how that relates to planes But if we imagine this distance is only like one meter or a couple centimeters Like let's say the water is here and like you just jump into the water Well, what what happens you just kind of submerge into it like very nice like no, no, nothing really happens um, keep, keep that in mind because that's going to be relevant. What's happening here is that as you jump, if the distance is pretty small, which means you're not going very fast, right? Gravity does not have enough time to accelerate you. So you're basically just making the water molecules move around and make room for you, right? What's happening is by the time you jump into the water, the water molecules have kind of gotten pushed aside and you just get into the water. The problem is as you get faster and faster, as, as the distance increases, let's say this is one kilometer, um, when you're coming when you're coming in the water molecules with absolute speed the water molecules have less time to get out of the way and thus you basically they, they start acting back on you instead of entirely moving moving away they start pushing you a little bit and then they move away and then if you were to make this distance like infinite what's going to end up happening is that, like let's say you're, you're falling at like extreme extreme speed then the water molecules like literally have no time to get out of the way at all and they entirely end up pushing back on you and then you end up like breaking all sorts of your bodies. Now keep that in mind because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see how that relates to lift. Now there's another thing over here that I have is a fish, and a fish usually has a tail. 
It has like a bunch of fins. It has a bunch of control elements that allows it to like navigate through the water, even though it's going very slow, right? Why is that? Well, it's because the water around it is very dense. And basically by pushing its tail one way, it's causing a force that's, that's causing the water to push back on it. And then the, the fish basically is using the, the density of the fluid, which is the water, to navigate itself through pushing on the water and the water pushes it back and it helps it navigate in the right direction. Now, how do these two things relate to airplanes and where does Bernoulli and Newton come into any of this? Well, let's go ahead and draw back the airplane with wing number one over here. This is our rudder. And then like, let's say this is wing number two. So basically what's happening is as the plane is about to take off, let's say this is like yeah, the cockpit, windows for passengers. This is an elevator, stabilizer, this is your rudder. And these control elements are gonna be relevant in a second. But the idea is that as this plane is starting to move, right now it's like, like before it starts moving, it's static. And there's like air molecules around it, right? And they're just kind of going around and they're just kind of bending around the wing. But what starts happening as the plane starts moving faster and faster, approaching the takeoff speed. So as it, as it goes faster and faster, um, it starts bumping into more air molecules in the same amount of time. And as it does that, now the air molecules, instead of just like immediately moving out of the way, they start pushing back a little bit and then get out of the way. Like the air still bounces upon the plane, except for this like part directly up front, it just bounces back immediately. So, so, so the, the molecules are just like bouncing and then they're like moving out of the way, right? Now what happens is if a plane starts going at like supersonic speed, like let's say it's in the air and it's going at like extreme, extreme, extreme distances, then similar like the dude jumping into the water, just like how the water molecules, as this person was coming at them with speed, did not have much time to get out of the way, have less time to get out of the way, a plane going at extremely fast speeds experiences the same thing where the air, air molecules literally like <laughs> cannot get out of the way and that may even cause the wind, uh, the wing to break. That means there's a force being generated by the air that's acting on the plane. So as the plane starts getting faster and faster, eventually it reaches a point, let's say, I don't know, above like 70 knots for certain smaller planes, above 100 knots, above 200 knots for like much larger airplanes. Um, knots is just the nautical miles, the speed basically, at, um, the speed at which the, the, the plane is going, not gonna get too much into that. But the idea is that as you're starting to go much faster and faster, now that this, these air molecules are starting to bounce, you're starting to generate an upward force. And this is where this topic is debated because now you'll see people saying, oh, according to the Bernoulli principle, because of how the wing is shaped or because if you increase the angle of attack, if you tilt the airplane a little bit, then you have much higher difference, uh, pressure difference. You have a lot of a lot pressure that's really high on the bottom and you have low pressure on the top, right? But then some people are like, no, that's not actually what's happening. What's happening is due to Newton's law, uh, these molecules are actually creating a force that's pushing on the wing and then that wing is basically pushing back and the air uh, ends up pushing the wing all together and that creates an upward force. But like, if you think about it, isn't that kind of the same thing? Like what is pressure? Pressure is just force over area, right? So you can think of pressure as just the array of forces that's acting on the wing. So as I go faster and faster, especially if I'm tilting my, my wing upwards and I'm increasing my angle of attack, well, duh, no wonder I'm gonna have higher pressure at the top and lower pressure at the bottom. And yes, you can design your wing in a way where it drops the pressure even lower at the top. That's what a lot of the wing shape people argue that actually causes lift, but it's not actually what's causing lift. What's causing lift is that you're using this control element here called a, uh, an elevator to change your angle of attack. You're starting to go very fast. And then as you, you're tilting the plane up, now, the wing, the, now, now you're basically increasing the pressure above below the wing, meaning you're increasing the array of forces and because the forces below the wing are much stronger than the forces above the wing, hence there's a pressure difference, well then, duh, no wonder the plane is gonna start going up. So you can think of it as Bernoulli, or you can think of it, at, and this is equal constant, or you can think of it as Newton. It's kind of the exact same thing because here, with Bernoulli, we're basically saying we're increasing the pressure below 
and that increases the array of forces that are acting on the wing, and that causes lift. With Newton, we're basically saying you're increasing the force, which again is basically the same thing as the, 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 the forces as, as the pressure distributed over the wings, and that's causing this mass to accelerate. That's causing the, the plane to go up in this upward direction, in the direction where the uh, pressure on the bottom is going. So now, okay, if that is responsible for, so, so basically, like the, the reason the plane starts flying is because the air molecules start behaving in a certain way that they start pushing the wing of the airplane up, right? And obviously, the, based on the shape of the wing, like they start curving in one way or another, but there is an interaction between the airplane and the wind particles that's causing the plane to go up. But now, what about these control elements? Like what makes this elevator even tilt the plane in the first place? Why does that happen? And this is where I want to focus on this part of Bernoulli's equation. This one half rho v squared. I'm just going to erase all of this. And I want to talk about a very cool concept. So in the Bernoulli equation, there's something called dynamic pressure. And it goes like this. It says the rho here is the, is, the, is the density of the material, and then v squared. So if we want to compare the pressure, the dynamic pressure of two different scenarios, well, basically, there's, there's, there's two things happening. There's the speed at which the, the object is going. And then there's the density of the material that it's going through. And this is where the, the plane and the fish comparison is really cool. Because if I were to picture this is a plane and this is a fish, why do they behave so similarly? They both have control elements. And they both like start moving the control elements to start controlling how they behave in the fluid. And this is where it gets really cool. Because the fish is in the water. That means the density is going to be m really high, right? Water is a lot more dense than, than air, meaning the fish can go at like very slow speeds, but it can still utilize its control elements because it's in a very dense medium. On the other hand, an airplane needs to go extremely fast because in order for the control elements to actually start working and start pushing the air molecules around, you need to increase the speed. So one of the reasons the plane besides generating the lift for, for the swing, in order for these control elements to actually start working, for the rudder to start working, for everything to start working, the plane has to be going fast. Because going fast is as if like you're increasing the density of the medium. And by increasing the density of the medium, you're able to push more on the particles around you, whether it's air while you're going very fast, or water while you're going very slow. And that's actually what causes your control elements to work. So fish and planes, are extremely, extremely similar. Even though they generate lift or, or upward force differently, here you're relying on the wing to generate lift. Fish rely on buoyancy to basically like float inside the water. But both of them have control elements that are only relevant thanks to this like dynamic pressure scenario. So if anyone ever asks you how an airplane flies, well, you can say, well, the plane starts going very fast and it, it tilts in a certain way where the air molecules start creating an upward force, and the plane starts flying. And if anyone asks you why those control elements only work or, or work like much more effectively once the plane starts going fast, and why they basically do nothing if the plane is standing still or like standing on the ground, well, you can then cite uh, the dynamic pressure and saying that if your medium is very, very low density, then you need to go extremely fast. And if your medium is very high density, like let's say water, then you don't need to go fast at all. And that's why you as a human can swim in the water uh, with very, very low speed because the water is dense enough for your hands to create forces uh, and make your control elements work. Anyway, that being said, I hope this gives you an intuitive explanation of what's going on. Um, and again, like I really dislike when people compare Bernoulli to Newton because at the end of the day, anything that happens in the macroscopic world is based on, on, on mechanics, mechanical physics. Um, so the, the Newton's laws are basically the foundation of any type of macro macro behavior that we observe. So I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison. I don't think you can compare uh, the Newton equation to the Bernoulli equation. If anything, they're kind of working hand in hand because one is telling you that there's a, a difference in pressure, which means the force over the same amount of distance or the same amount of area is going to be a difference. And Newton is telling you, okay, now that you have a force, acting on the mass, mass is going to start accelerating. So I don't know, what's the big deal? Anyway, um, I, I, I'm confident this is going to spark some comments. Uh, this is, again, a topic that has a lot of <laughs> videos on YouTube. This is how I see it. This is how I'm confident um, thing, th things work. Just because I, I look at things from the very basic lens of 
like like mechanics and electromagnetics and i feel like if you have a deep understanding of those things um, you can leverage the equations to deepen your understanding but if you're if you're building your entire understanding on the equations and you can't like actually perceive or see or intuit what's going on then i really think you're in deep trouble and i even if you're not like i just think you don't really enjoy physics that much because physics is for like understanding and feeling not just for like writing equations that being said i'll see you guys in the next video peace love